Well, good morning. Good morning and welcome to church on this beautiful spring morning. It is good to be together in the house of the Lord. I understand there's a significant uh, event tomorrow, another snowstorm coming. No, no, solar eclipse. Um, it has been such a blessing to me, I'm sure to many of us, last week with Easter, uh, the celebration we had, the baptisms. Um, this week we continue um, to, to be blessed by the Lord. This morning we welcome back Chris Samuel, his wife Jillian are with us from the Met. Uh, he'll be preaching this morning, giving uh, uh, the sermon today, and so welcome to both of you today. Uh, but also we have uh, Walter and Florence uh, Grob with us, who have been uh, before to report in their missions work in Cameroon. They'll be sharing a bit during the service. But uh, me and my genius, when I, I realized they were coming, I thought to myself, well, wait a minute. Uh, Florence is heavily involved in her music ministry at church. And so being the genius that I am, I said, wait a minute. <laughs> you could join us uh, in singing. And so we welcome her this morning and thank you for bearing with me as the church has learned to do for many years. Um, it's good to have you here. That said, I will... Uh, no. There's a reminder. We have a business meeting. Look at that. I remembered. That was pretty good. <laughs> Tuesday night at 7 p.m., we have an update on the land development. We have um, incorporation. We have lots of things, uh, the annual review of the budget. So please, if you're able to attend here, 7 p.m. Tuesday night. Look at that. I remembered. Would you stand with me as we hear from God's word? His call to worship to you and I this morning comes from Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. Let's pray together. Father God, we are so grateful for this day. Your glory is revealed in the things that you have made. The sun, moon, stars, all of these things display your wisdom, your power, and your majesty. But it is in and through your Son, Jesus Christ, in his life, death, and resurrection that we behold your glory most clearly. We pray, Father, that you would pour out your Spirit on us now, that we might worship you, in reverence and awe. Give us, Lord, a feeling sense of the truths that we hear and sing about today. Singing your praises lifts our hearts. It is you alone that is the source of everlasting joy. So we pray that you'd help us now to rest in your grace, your goodness, and your faithfulness. May everything we say, everything that we do during this service bring honor and glory to your name, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now let's raise our voices together with joy and enthusiasm.
Please join with me in reading from the book of Jeremiah. We're going to read Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Jeremiah 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be with my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. God's word. May we have a time of prayer. Our Father and our God, we come before you at this time to worship you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We have never seen you, Lord, but we recognize you when we look at all that you have created. Kingship belongs to you, our most high God, as you rule over all the nations. You, Lord, sit enthroned forever. Merciful God, you have chosen us through Christ to belong to you, set apart from others to worship you as our Savior. And we realize if left to ourselves, we would remain your enemies, separated from your love and protection. Still, we continue to sin against you because of our attachments to the amusements of the world. 
Like Paul, we do that which we hate. Part of us longs to be sinless and holy. Still, there remains a part of us that clings to sin. Help us, our Father, to run from our sin. Draw us near to you, recognizing how offensive our sin is to you and how damaging it is to us. Keep before us the realization that one day we will stand before you to give an account for our actions. Now, our Father, we pray for the various government leaders that their decisions will serve you. We pray for all involved in ministry here at FBC, as well as the missionaries like Walter and Florence Crow, who serve in faraway lands. We ask that many are drawn to you because of their actions. We pray for those amongst us who are sick. We pray for their hearing. We pray for those who are struggling financially, that food and shelter are provided. We pray for those who suffer through addictions and dependencies that they can overcome these problems and that we can remain compassionate of all regardless what they struggle with. We pray for the other church families, both here in Arm Prior and around the world, who share the gospel message. Bless their actions and cause it to bear for fruit for your glory. Finally, Father, prepare our hearts and minds to receive your message this morning. All this we ask in your Son's name, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As I mentioned at the, uh, the beginning of the service, we have uh, a privilege to once again hear from uh, Walter and Florence Grob. I uh, did some research uh, in um, preparing for this morning by way of introduction. Uh, I understand that Walter was born and raised in Hamilton in a Christian family, went to our sister church, Mission Baptist, where he was baptized at the age of 14. Uh, served as a Sunday school teacher, served as a youth leader, served on the deacon board. Uh, Florence was also raised in a Christian home in a very similar town. Banso, Cameroon, uh, was uh, discipled, actually, I learned, uh, from uh, one of our missionaries from Alberta Baptist Association, where I, Trudy, fr uh, I served uh, many, when I started in, in ministry, um, after high school, she studied dentistry, returned to Cameroon, worked for the Cameroonian Baptist Health Convention. Uh, they met on the mission field in Cameroon, were married the same year as my wife and I in 1995. Uh, Going to be celebrating our something anniversary coming up. <laughs> Can't do math. We'll talk after. You're good at numbers. <laughs> Florence runs a, a, a dentistry pr practice there in Bemenda, enjoys uh, ministering uh, music as a choir director at her church. Uh, meanwhile, it is through uh, the discipleship and mentoring of uh, Walter uh, through the Cameroonian Baptist Association that, uh, that is growing in the finance department and stewardship uh, there. And so it is our pleasure to hear from them a report of their work uh, that they're doing for the Lord in Cameroon. And so would you put your hands together, welcome uh, Walter as he gives a report at this time. Even almost my whole report. <laughs> Good morning. And uh, I've been asked by the Christians of Nquen Baptist Church in Bamenda to give every supporting church their greetings, and also the uh, staff of the headquarters of the Cameroon Baptist Convention. They said, give your greetings from us. They really appreciate the, send, the churches that send missionaries to Cameroon, and, and they want your, you to have their greetings. So I grew up in the Hamilton area, and I struggled with that question, what are you going to be when you grow up? And I would have loved to be a professional hockey player but I lacked one thing, talent. Uh, and so I, in my university days, I was struggling, what are you going to be? And I went uh, to a uh, missions conference for um, students and the needs of the world to hear the gospel, the, the difficulties some areas of the world have to hear the gospel compared to, were compared with North America. And, the speaker there, George Burwer, he said, if you guys who are here at a missions conference won't commit to two years to going on the mission field, who will go? And I thought, well, yeah, I don't even know what I want to be. Why don't I make a commitment? So I made him a commitment back in 
1983. And uh, I went to Cameroon. And the slides are not there. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, go to the next one. Yeah, so Cameroon there is on the um, uh, west coast of Africa. It has a, a rainy and dry season. I'll tell a, a little more later. But we work with the Cameroon Baptist Convention, the North American Baptist. And the churches there are like churches here. They're self-governing and self-financing. But the, to assist the ministries of the convention, they have run hospitals and health centers. They run... Uh, primary schools and secondary schools. Originally, it was only the missions that were running schools. They run seminaries, of course, to two seminaries to raise up pastors uh, and a radio station, printing press. And all these ministries, apart from the churches, they're run in one big financial system. And that's where I come in. I'm part of the team that uh, helps run that financial system. So it isn't frontline evangelism. It isn't frontline discipleship. But uh, the body of Christ needs different parts, and m the mission work needs different parts. And it, when God's resources are well handled, I think that helps the gospel go out. So I've uh, been serving uh, in Cameroon. I started as a short-term missionary to answer that call to missions uh, in uh, 1988. I was to go for two years. I ended up going for three years. And then... Uh, returned to Cameroon in uh, 1994, and from 1994 to 2017, I served as the head of the accounting or finance department. And then in 20, end of 2017, it was decided we need a Cameroonian now to head that department. So uh, I moved over to uh, becoming the uh, cooperating missions accountant and, uh, a part, and uh, to serve... Uh, so there's different, besides the North American Baptists, there's other missions working with the Cameroon Baptist Convention. So I make sure their finances uh, are properly go in and go, uh, are properly reported. Um, I also as, uh, serve as a Sunday school teacher in Cameroon. And on the Baptists, uh, in Quen Baptist Center, that's the headquarters, there's someone there who's supposed to make sure there's security, utilities, and maintenance. And because he wasn't doing quite a good job, the leadership said, you, we want you to supervise him. So that, that's my second job. Florence, of course, has her, her dental practice, and she's also involved in uh, music ministry, both a choir director and several song groups. Um, she has been sustained by her dental practice in Bomenda over the years, but this last four-year term, because of the insecurity in Cameroon and the, the uh, socio-political crisis, many of her patients would not come to Bamenda anymore because of the uh, insecurity there. So she opened up a second dental clinic in Douala. And so we've been living kind of a tale of two cities a bit um, where she's had that, she's uh, maintained the one in Bamenda, one of her staff has made, a couple of her staff are maintaining one, but she's also working in Douala. And if you have opportunity to come to the adult Sunday school class, we'll tell you more about those issues going on. But looking ahead, uh, we, the plan is to return to Cameroon by mid-July. I will still be working in the finance area, but I'll also be taking on a new role as um, the director of cooperating missions serving as a liaison with the um, uh, between the Cameroon Baptist Convention and all the different missions that work with them. So um, I'm not that young anymore and one of the things I'm praying for this uh, looking ahead is that there will be uh, some, God's going to raise up a new generation of missionaries to go out uh, uh, to serve among least reached peoples. Right now m most of our all of our missionaries in Cameroon are well over 40 and above. So we're, we're really looking for uh, younger people. So if you will join with me in praying for the next generation, we'll appreciate it. And just want to thank uh, First Baptist Church. You've been supporting us for many, many years. And without uh, churches like you, we can't be doing what we're doing. So thank you.
Welter. I really appreciate to hear the Lord's work uh, that he's doing around the world. I want to invite those who are helping to serve communion to come forward at this time as we come to the Lord's table. I want to introduce by reading from Matthew 26. <clears throat> we, uh, we celebrated Easter last week, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, just before going to the cross. Of course, Jesus had one more meal with his disciples as he was eating with them. It says in Matthew 26, he took bread, and after he blessed it, he broke it and gave it to them. He said, take and eat. This is my body. And then he took a cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and he said, drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And then he said, I tell you this, that you and I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Amen. This morning, as we come to the communion table, we invite any of you who have put your faith in Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior to join us as we partake in this meal together as we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Before we do, we want to spend some time in silent prayer, reflection, examining our hearts and preparing to receive this meal, and then we'll read together the Apostles' Creed as a public profession of our faith. Would you bow your heads with me at this time as we spend some time in silent prayer and reflection? you join me as we profess our faith together in reading from the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, he descended to the dead, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. passage that uh, Chris will be preaching on this morning comes from 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul writes, receive from the Lord that which I deliver to you. Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. I want to invite Gord to pray for the bread at this time. The bread serves to remind us that our Lord and Savior became the substitutional sacrifice to redeem us from our sin. It represents Christ's body, which was broken for us. Even though he knew no sin, he bore our sin and paid the debt of our sin on the cross. By his death on the cross, his righteousness paid the debt of our sin. And our sin is forgiven. It is remembered no more. And rising from the tomb, death and sin were defeated. And so we have the hope of eternity with you. So we eat this bread with thankfulness in remembrance and pro proclaiming the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper and he said this cup is the new covenant in my blood I invite Dave to pray for the cup at this time Father as we turn now to the cup it represents uh, the spilt blood of Christ his spilt blood is his death it was a death that was made necessary by our sinfulness, by our turning away from you and our inability to save ourselves. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for your willingness, even though you knew full well the full extent that you would suffer. You chose to come anyway and take our place on the cross. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Jesus said, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. How thankful we are for the deep, deep love of Jesus. Let's sing together this beautiful old hymn.
hope that he provides. once again and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 17 through 34. First Corinthians 11. 
But in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup in the, of the Lord is in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. And when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If an anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. God's word. Good morning, everyone. So uh, a few months, <coughs> excuse me, a few months ago, uh, I heard a story of a man who was um, known especially by his family for his uh, absent-mindedness. In fact, the only good thing about this man was the fact that he was a college professor. Um, he, was, he was very, very forgetful. You know, he'd often forget his socks or his keys or his wallet or where he was going or, you know, important engagements. In fact, if it weren't for his um, very patient and loving wife, he certainly would have been fired a long time ago um, because of the problems of his weak memory. Uh, and one morning, when he came down uh, to breakfast, his wife said, now, dear, don't forget, today is moving day. While you're at work today, the movers will come uh, and will move us to our new home, which is a few blocks from here. Uh, and he reassured her that she had nothing to fear. I mean, how could, he, how could he possibly forget the special day? You know, they had talked about it and planned about it for months. But knowing her husband's nature, she said once more, Dear, please don't forget, today is moving day. Uh, so remember, don't come to this house after work. And, you know, come to our new house. Well, he vowed not to forget. Taking his lunchbox and his briefcase in hand, he headed off to work. Uh, and, and to help him remember, his wife, in fact, put like post-it notes uh, in his briefcase and lunchbox, and she even called him the afternoon to remind him once again that it was moving day and that he should come to the new house um, and not to the old house after, the last, after his last class. But all these efforts were in vain, because true to form, uh, when he left the campus around 5 in the evening, he absentmindedly drove right to his old house. Uh, and he put his key in the lock, entered, and saw that everything was gone. Furniture, curtain, clothes from the closets, everything was gone. At first, he panicked. You know, maybe he thought his family had abandoned him for, so for some reason, or maybe there had been some sort of foul play. Uh, but after about 10 minutes of kind of wandering about, uh, he remembered what had happened. You know, it was moving day. You know, his family hadn't left him. There was no alien abduction. Uh, but no matter how hard he tried, he could not remember where his new house was. 
uh, he, could, he, tr he tried really hard. He tried to recall where, where to go to this new house. So he ran outside, kind of was looking around, and he saw this little boy riding his bicycle on the sidewalk uh, in front of his house. And so he called the boy over and he said, hey kid, uh, do you know the family that used to live here? Uh, and, and do you know where they actually moved? The little boy with a disgusted look on his face looked at this man and said, ah, oh, dad, mom said you could forget. I mean, I think you and I can relate to a certain aspect of the story, um, you know, because we too uh, often struggle with a failing memory. You know, we're quite often creatures of habit. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's not to this extent, uh, but, you know, when we consistently do something and, and uh, again and again and again, you know, we kind of forget why we're doing it, right? We just have this, uh, our, our, our second nature kicks in and, you know, uh, we just do it mundanely. And, uh, yeah, in fact, I myself have struggles like that, similar to this gentleman I talked about. When, I, when my wife and I moved ho homes, I struggled to remember to actually you know, take the right road back to our new home. I would often uh, go the opposite way to our old house. Um, but, yeah, so, yeah, I just, want, I just wanted to say that story because it, it is quite relatable. You know, we are people of habit, and we do struggle with uh, memory failure. You know, just consistent repetition uh, causing us to just go about something in a mundane way and forget the importance of it, why we do it in the first place. And I think one such practice in our church today is communion. And especially if you grew up in church, it sometimes becomes almost this, you know, just box to tick off the first Sunday of every month. And we do it so routinely. Uh, and yes, the pastor comes and he gives us a little passage to remind us, but, you know, it just kind of goes over our head. You know, we're supposed to have that moment of silence, that prayer. It just, yeah, it just becomes so routine that we actually forget the vitality of it. And, and here's the irony regarding communion, right? Uh, specifically because Jesus actually instituted communion to partially be a technique of memory association. Now, he meant it to be a way for us to remember his sacrificial death on the cross. You know? However, unfortunately, communion in, in some of our hearts has just become something that we do the first of every month. We don't actually think about and consider the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Now, I know when it comes to what communion is, we've come to understand uh, that the bread and the wine that we use in communion are sacraments. And, you know, the sacraments are defined by St. Augustine as a, as a visible sign of an invisible reality. And it's also been called as a physical token that expresses a spiritual reality and an outward visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. And, you know, communion is actually a very important uh, ordinance because it's part of the doctrine of the church. And in, in light of the importance of this practice, in light of the vitality of this practice, so we're actually going to spend some time looking at Paul's words on the Lord's Supper in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And of course, that's the passage that um, Pastor Lee, not too long ago, read before we partook in, the, uh, in communion. So that's what we're going to start. We're going to be looking at, uh, we're going to, we're, we're going to, we will be studying to see what we're, we are to be doing through communion, as instructed by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But before we do that, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to you in Jesus' name. We're so grateful yeah, for your sacrifice, Jesus, on the cross. Thank you for giving us salvation. Thank you for yeah, our ability that we have to become children of God. Uh, I pray that, Lord, even as we study communion, that our hearts may be drawn closer to you, that we may be able to yeah, witness um, the reality of what happened in the cross uh, in our hearts and love you more uh, and be drawn closer to you more and have our affections turned up um, towards you in our hearts. Yeah, Holy Spirit, convict our hearts today and yeah, we commit the rest of the time into hands and ask all of this, Lord, in, of our, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Great. Right, so uh, please grab your Bibles with me and turn one more time to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm not going to read the whole passage once again. Uh, I'm just going to just highlight a few verses. Uh, and as you turn there, I'll just give you some context around this passage as we read uh, just a few minutes ago. Uh, so as Paul writes to the Corinthians, he notices that the Lord's Supper is not being pra practiced properly, uh, mainly because of some divisions in the in the church. Um, and, uh, and so his 
task in this passage that we read is him laboring to tell them how it's to be correctly observed. Uh, And so I'm just going to read just uh, a few verses from verse 23 really quick. Uh, So 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord is an un- in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. I mean, this is a passage, <clears throat> I think, which would be fairly familiar to uh, most of you here. Um, but as we study this passage here this morning, I'd like to, us to notice three directions that we're called to look when partaking in communion. So as we partake in communion, we're first called to look back. Through communion, we're called to look back and remember Jesus' death on the cross. I mean, even when he constituted communion at the Last Supper, which Pastor Lee read not too long ago in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Think about it. The one incident in his ministry that Jesus selected to be preserved and to be memorialized is his death on the cross. Right? Whenever he performed a miracle, he never said, you know, build an altar here so you won't forget about this. So he never said, oh, you know, carve a statue so you remember me. No, no, no. In fact, he, he did the exact opposite, right? Frequently, Jesus said, don't tell anyone about this. You know, don't memor- memorialize this. But his death was different, right? Um, he did not want us to forget his death. He, in fact, he constantly referred to it as the high hour of his life. So then he used this meal. You know, at the Last Supper, he used the meal to make a memory so that we would always remember that Jesus died for the sins of every person who has ever existed and put their faith in him. Malcolm Mudridge once said, one thing at least can be said with certainty about the crucifixion of Christ. It was manifestly the most famous death in history. No other death has aroused one hundredth of the interest or has been remembered with one hundredth of the intensity and concern. So then why is his death so important? And why must we never forget it? Well, we must never forget it because it was by his death that humanity received redemption from their sins. It's by his death that we too have been redeemed from our sins. And in dying, Jesus took our sins upon himself and he died in our place. So then when we partake of this meal, we remember that when Jesus died, there was this great exchange. In fact, we sang a song uh, kind of about that. You know, he became poor so that we might become rich. He laid aside the rights of deity so that, and he became our servant. He gave up perfection to become sin for us. And he died so that we might live. You know, communion reminds us to look back, you know, and it reminds us to, uh, it reminds us how our holy God exchanged his only son for sinful people like you and me. So you see, Jesus' death is something that we must never forget. Furthermore, I know the sacraments of communion, which, uh, which are the bread and the wine, are symbolic of his death too. You know, the the broken bread calls us to kind of look back and remember that Jesus' body was broken for us. You know, broken by the nails that pierced his hands and feet. And and the spear that pierced his side. And as we partake, we remember that his body was broken so that we could be forgiven and restored and made whole. And the cup symbolizes his blood, which leads us to look back and, and remember that his blood was shed so that our sins could be washed away. You know, the things that we do uh, during communion itself are meant to make us look back at the magnificent sacrifice on the cross. 
In his book Reunion, um, uh, Bruxy uh, Cavey writes about the Victoria Cross. He said the Victoria Cross is a is a Canadian uh, is Canada's highest military honor, and it's similar to the Medal of Honor in the in the United States. You know, these medals are awarded for personal acts of valor about and beyond the call of duty. The first Victoria Cross of World War II was awarded to Company Sergeant Major John Robert Osborne. Uh, the Sergeant Major and his men were cut off from their battalion and under heavy attack. Uh, when the enemy came close enough, the Canadian soldiers would be subjected to a concentrated barrage of uh, grenades. And several times, Osborne protected his men by picking up live grenades and then throwing them back. Uh, but eventually, one fell just in the wrong position to pick up in time. With only a split second to decide, Osborne shouted a warning and threw himself on top of the grenade. It exploded, killing him instantly. The rest of the company survived that battle because of Osborne's selfless, other-centeredness. I mean, self-sacrificial stories like this are just so heartwarming, and uh, they're just so wonderful to hear, aren't they? And yeah, we just want to applaud their valor and their bravery. After all, greater love hath no man than he lay down his life for his friends. And also, knowing that you know, John Osborne was actually a Christian, his sacrifice would have been inspired by his understanding of Christ's sacrifice for all of us. However, as we applaud John Osborne's heroic act, I want, us to, I want to remind us that it's nowhere near what Jesus did. Because John Osborne jumped on that grenade because of the love that he had for his comrades, for his friends. You know, Jesus died on the cross, not only for his friends, but also his enemies. We were all his enemies before we trusted him. You know, wanting to go against God's plan and God's will. Yet, Jesus was willing to lay down his life for us. Is that not so much more glorious. Is that not so much greater? That someone will be willing to lay down his life for his enemies. And that's the thing, that's the thing that uh, we are to remember when looking at the communion. You know, we are to look back at the incredible sacrifice that Jesus did on the cross. Giving up his life for you and for me. So that's the first thing. We have to look back at the glory of Christ on the cross and his incredible sacrifice. Secondly, when partaking in communion, we're to look inward. Let's look at verses uh, 27 to 29 one more time. So it says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord is in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. I mean, this, this whole section here kind of has a solemn ring to it, doesn't it? Like Paul is insistent that the Corinthian church and us today are to be very serious when it comes to partaking in the Lord's table. And he wants us to stamp out anything that is unworthy when it comes to, you know, being a part of the Lord's table. Because it, it, is, it is a privilege, right? It, it's, and it's a very high calling to be able to partake in communion. And, and this calls us to take a very strict, introspective look into our own hearts before we come to the Lord's table, as he says, lest we drink judgment on ourselves. Whew, that's, that's, that's pretty strong language there. Yeah, it, it, he's really amplifying the seriousness of this ordinance. And David Pryor, Pryor actually comments on this this way. He says, when Paul take, talks of anyone who eats the bread and drinks the cup uh, unworthily as guilty of profaning the body and blood of Christ, the word profaning is actually, it actually reduces the gravity of the offense. Essentially, you become guilty of shedding the blood of Christ. That is, you place yourself not in the company of those who are sharing the benefits of his sacrifice, but rather in the company of those who are responsible for his crucifixion. It's, it's, it's a pretty serious thing that we're, we're supposed to be uh, partaking in when it comes to communion. But it's very important that we actually prepare, prepare ourselves, that we, that we prepare our hearts before we partake in the Lord's table. And understanding the seriousness also calls us to ask the question then of who is able to partake in the Lord's Supper? And answering this question is the reason why 
as was mentioned earlier, communion is to be taken only by those who have accepted the Lord and Savior as Lord, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. For those who have not, it is a time to reflect and consider taking that step of accepting Christ, especially inside of the you know, sacrifice that we just talked about, the magnanimous sacrifice on the cross. However, there's often another pastoral dilemma that quite often raises from this uh, in churches, um, because some congregants choose to hold back from partaking in the communion because they feel that they're not worthy. And then there's the other side where some freely indulge without the slightest self-examination. So then, how are we to properly approach Paul's instruction here today? Well, looking at the context, you know, looking at the verses right above um, the passages that we're looking at right now, and just looking around the context of the Corinthian church that Paul is writing to, part of the self-examination should include the way we treat other members of the body of Christ. Because remember, Paul started this text by addressing how some in the Corinthian church were being divisive and they were mistreating other members around the table. So a biblical commentator, he helpfully puts it there, but he says, the context implies that the self-examination will specially be directed to ascertaining whether or not he is living and acting in love and charity with his neighbors. However, I don't think Paul is limiting the self-examination just to our actions regarding those around us. No, I think we see, as we see multiple times in scripture, as Christians who have accepted the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we are called to imitate Jesus. Right? We are called to imitate uh, the way Jesus lived, life, lived his life when he was here on earth. You know, we're called to imitate Christ in our own walks of life. And through the sanctification of the Holy Spirit, we strive daily to achieve this. So when approaching the Lord's table, we are called to self-examine how this Christian walk is going. You know, how we're living our life, how well we are doing to imitate Christ. Now, I don't think uh, the Christian is obliged to reach some sort of you know, moral or spiritual standard of perfection. Now, I don't think that's what's expected when uh, we come uh, to partake in communion. Um, however, there should be a rigorous and honest self-scrutiny that should happen uh, um, as we approach uh, communion. You know, there should be this self-examination that should, in fact, yield repentance. Because we are, we are still sinners. Okay? And, and that should be our approach. So a, a more practical way of, of applying this is by asking God to search our hearts, to point out our sin, you know, the thoughts and actions that could be offensive towards him, you know, attitude and actions that hinder our relationship with him. And in these moments of looking inward, we are to confess those sins. We are to, yeah, repent. And then we, are, we can experience the promise from 1 John 1, 1.9 uh, that because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So when partaking in communion, we already talked about firstly, we are to look back. And secondly, we are called to look inwards have that honest self-examination of where our hearts are. And finally, we are called to look forward. And whenever we come to the table, we not only look back to the cross, no, we're, we're look, called to look inward, but also we're, look, we're called to look forward to his coming again. Look at verse 26. He says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We have not seen the last of Jesus Christ. You know, he, he is coming again. In, in John 14, he promised, I will prepare a place for you. I will come back and take you to be with me that you may be where I am. So you see, the Lord's Supper is a symbol not just of a meal that happened 2,000 years ago, but also of one that will occur when Jesus comes back. And when Jesus comes back in Revelation 19.9, it says that we will all sit down and enjoy the wedding supper of the Lamb. We will gather with the loved ones and the friends and our, and our Lord and rejoice and be glad. So communion reminds us to prepare for this wonderful day for when the Lord will come and take us home. And Paul says that communion is this proclamation of his death until he returns. 
But I think I do think it should remind us for this, you know, uh, ongoing need to prepare our hearts um, for His return. And this, this week, as I was preparing uh, to speak this morning, uh, I came across this article um, uh, that was helpful in just thinking about how, uh, how our, uh, thinking about and reflecting in our own hearts um, in preparing for the Lord's return. And I would like to read, us, read it to us this morning. This is what he says. Jesus called the other day to say he was passing through and wondered if he could spend a day or two with us. I said, sure, love to see you. When will you hit town? I mean, it's Jesus, you know, and it's not every day you get a chance to visit with him. It's not like it's your in-laws and you have to stop and decide whether the advantageous outweigh having to move uh, to the sleeper sofa. Uh, and that's when Jesus told me he was actually at a convenience store out by the in, 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 interstate. I mean, I must, have gotten that, uh, I, mean, I must have gotten that Bambi in headlights look because my wife hissed, what is it? What's wrong? Who's that? So I covered the receiver and told her Jesus was going to arrive in eight minutes. So she ran out of the room and started giving guidance to the kids in an effective way that, you know, marine drill inspect instructors would give to the recruits. My mind was already racing with what needed to be done in the next eight, no, seven minutes. So Jesus wouldn't think that we were, you know, slobs. Uh, I turned off the TV in the den, which was blaring some weird, scary movie that I'd been watching, uh, which I'd been half watching, but I could still hear screams from a bedroom. So I turned off the reality show that it was turned to. Plus, I turned off, to the, uh, I turned off the Wi-Fi. I didn't want our kids with their noses and their smartphones when Jesus arrived. Six minutes from now. My wife had already thinned out the magazines that I'd been accumulating on the coffee table. She put Christianity Today on top for a good first impression. Five minutes to go, I looked out the front window, but the yard actually looked great thanks to my long, hard work, so I let it go. What could I improve in four minutes anyway? I didn't notice the mail had come, so I ran out to grab it, mostly a bunch of catalogs tied into recent purchases, so I stuffed it back in the box. Jesus doesn't need to get the wrong idea. Three minutes from now. And how much online shopping, about how, how, how much online shopping we do? I ran back in and picked up a bunch of shoes left by the door. I tried to stuff them in the first front closet, but it was overflowing with heavy coats and work coats and snow coats and pretty coats and raincoats and extra coats. We live in the South. Why do we buy so many coats? I squeezed the shoes in with two minutes to go. I plumped up my sofa pillows. My wife tossed dishes into the sink. I scolded the kids and she shooed the dog. With one minute left, I realized something important. Getting ready for a visit from Jesus is not an eight-minute job. Then the doorbell rang. And it's kind of a, it's kind of a funny story. It's kind of a funny little article. Uh, but it really does cause us to reflect on our own lives, does it not? Like, coming to terms with the reality of, you know, Christ can return any time. Well, let me ask us, how many of us are ready? I, as we look forward for the coming of our Lord, I wonder how, mu how many of us are prepared. It certainly is not an eight-minute job. No, we're to be consistently ready, you know, waiting eagerly. As, as, as we see in the, in the parable of the ten virgins, we're supposed to be ready at all times. And we believe communion serves to remind us of his eminent return and remind us to prepare our hearts, to prepare ourselves. It also says it helps us to proclaim his death until he comes again, as we look forward to it. You know, it helps us, it, it centers our eyes, and it also prompts us to live with our eyes focused on the future to the day that Jesus will return. To strive to live in such a way that we're, we are ready for that day to dawn. So, with communion, we're called to look forward. Look forward to the day that Jesus will return. You know, there, there are various views on the meaning and the interpretation of the Lord's Supper. You know, Catholics believe in what they call uh, transubstantiation. Uh, this is a belief that when a person partakes at, this, uh, uh, at the Lord's table, the Lord performs a miracle and actually changes the bread into the actual body of Jesus and the wine into the actual blood of Jesus. And meanwhile, the Lutherans believe in a thing called consubstantiation. 
And there's a belief that the Holy Spirit is present with the bread and the cup and gives them unusual powers of blessing. Um, and theirs is not the same belief of Catholics, but it's not that far from it. However, if, you, if we study the text properly, if we, if we take some time to reflect um, on the text that we have in, uh, today, in fact, we can see that this ordinance is, is symbolic. Right? We believe that this bread and cup are a symbol of the death of Jesus on our behalf. We, we believe that there is no saving power either in the Lord's Supper or in baptism. No, they're, they're both pictures of Jesus' death and resurrection. And so, in light of that, when we partake, as we notice from Paul's words here in 1 Corinthians 11, um, we need to remember that communion helps us to look back at Christ's sacrifice or to look inward as we introspectively discern the plight of our hearts uh, as we prepare to partake in the Lord's Supper. And finally, we are to look forward to the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Father, we just are so, so grateful. We're just so, so thankful. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice on the cross. Thank you for taking our sins and, and redeeming us. Holy Spirit, I just, yeah, I just pray that yeah, even today as we did partake in communion, pray that in our hearts that, yeah, you will help us look back and remember and glorify and give praise for your sacrifice. But so look inward and, and, and repent. Repent for the sin in our hearts. And, and Lord, help us to look forward and prepare our hearts and look forward to, the, to your return joyfully. We thank you once again for all that you've done and thank you for who you are. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for that message that made us think. Let's stand and sing together the, our closing hymn. A hymn of triumph. <coughs>
Amen. A reminder, if you're able to, to uh, join us in the CE Hall after. We're going to hear from Walter and Florence about their uh, ministry work in Cameroon. And so if you're able, join us for that. Some time of coffee fellowship, some uh, Q&A, and to hear about uh, that report as well. God's word of benediction to you and I this morning comes from Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.